warm welcome to Tridip Sarud, who has um, come here after, you know, it's been a while since we wanted him here, but he had not been able to make time for it, so I'm really happy it's happening at last. Uh, Trudip is a university professor at SEPT, Ahmedabad, Center for Environment Planning and Technology. Uh, Trudip, as many of you may already know, is, a, is our foremost Gandhi scholar, but more broadly an intellectual historian, and a very, very fine translator uh, from Gujarati to English. He has translated this foundational novel in Gujarat, written in the late 19th century. It's a four-volume novel called Saraswati Chandra by Govindram Tripathi. Uh, the book that he published last year, which is a critically annotated edition of Gandhi's autobiography, has been um, has received a lot of critical acclaim, and his talk will address his effort um, that we see in that book. Um, his lecture is titled "The Story of Antaryami." Thank you. Um, last time I was to be here, we had to announce national mourning. So it's not very good for me to, to go and, and, and lecture in universities. So um, uh, if something's happened today, I'm not to be blamed, right? Uh, um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, um, writing about oneself has been a very difficult thing in India. Among the various literary forms or knowledge forms which emerge in the 19th century, late 19th century, one of them is the autobiography. Now if you look at the history of the autobiography in various Indian languages, the th it's marked by three things. Each one, each pioneering autobiography, and when I say pioneering autobiography, the first autobiography, in each Indian language, with the exception of Bangla, says, one, how difficult it is to speak about oneself because the form is so alien. The idea of the first person narrative is very alien, and how do you how do you do that philosophically? How do you do that uh, thing? Second problem is, why am I then doing it? And then there is this long thing that people go into as to my, my life is not really worth an autobiography. I've done nothing. And then they would go on to proceed to write four volumes, as in Malayalam uh, um, or in Gujarati, uh, large. Uh, their justification is that autobiography is actually a, is a modernizing impulse. When I write an autobiography in Gujarati or in Marathi or in Hindustani um, or even Marwadi, I am actually introducing the idea of the modern into my language and into my tradition of thinking about the self which has not existed before. So it's seen as the real advent of modernity into the language. But the problem of speaking of oneself in a form that is completely Christian persisted. Uh, there is no denying the fact that you can't think of the autobiography as a secular form for a very, very long time till retired generals decided to write their autobiographies, robbing us of the pleasure of reading them completely. Uh, uh, these were seen as um, uh, judges and lawyer, judges and generals should be barred from writing autobiographies. Uh, um, you know, um, but these were seen as Christian documents. Um, why Christian? Because it had a structure you speak of a certain kind of darkness, a moment or a process of finding light, and then leading that life according to that light. So you had to have that moment of enlightenment. And that's what really autobiography in the Western world uh, was. And that's really what we try to do 
uh, in India. But since we did not have that moment of enlightenment, none of the people who wrote the early autobiographies had a moment of enlightenment. Only moment of enlightenment in that sense would have been contact with Europe, uh, learning, going and doing a good BA at Elphinstone College in Bombay and then said, ah, I, I need to modernize my language, so I'm going to write in Marathi or in Gujarati. So that problem persisted. And really, uh, and why am I spending time talking about it? Because the very first thing that Gandhi says in the autobiography um, is this. He says, when I decided to write the autobiography, a friend came to me, a God-fearing friend, not just any friend, a God-fearing friend. Um, he had other friends, clearly, who were not God-fearing, uh, and came to him on his day of silence, wise man. If you ever wanted to go to Gandhi, you go to him on his day of silence. That's what Mountbatten also did. Uh, um, came to me on my day of silences, what kind of a misadventure are you on? And why is that misadventure? He says, nobody has been known to write an autobiography among us, among the Gujaratis or among the Indians, except those who've come under Western influence. And then Gandhi then begins to talk about the form of the autobiography. And that's a very, very, if you one way to read that, those just about five lines carefully, Gandhi does an amazing creative transformation. He says, what I want to speak about is not about the self. What I wish to speak about are my experiments with truth. Therefore, while employing the autobiographical form, I'm actually not writing about myself. He creates that disjunction between narrating one's life and narrating the story of experiments with truth. Gandhi's contention being that if you were to think of the self not as the karta of events, but as somebody who, in, or, or the self as that thing or that entity which enables this set of experiments, you would probably get a different kind of a literary form. And that's really what the autobiography seeks to do. Now, the title itself um, is very interesting. Um, in Gujarati, um, it's called Satyana Prayogo. Uh, in Hindustan, it would be Satya Ke Prayog. Right? Um, one, one very literal way of translating that would be truth's experiment. Now, what does, how does truth actually experiment? And who does the truth experiment on? The truth experiments on me. And that's how the story is to begin. At no point in Gujarati that does the word autobiography appear in the title. It's much later that these things begin to, to, to acquire a different kind of thing. So we have to, to remember that when we read Gandhi's autobiography, we have to read, we have to un know that three things. One, that actually, although there were three autobiographies in Gujarati written in the 19th century, only one was published. The other two documents came to be published much after Gandhi died. One in 1956, the other in 1970s. Right? Although written in 1880s. These were not released, not published for a century. So there was only one autobiographical narrative uh, or talking about oneself, uh, which was available to Gandhi as, as a model. There was another semi-autobiographical account by a man called Narayan Hemchandra who figures in the autobiography itself as this kind of a slightly crazy, globe-trotting Gujarati uh, who has, and, and he figures in there because he has complete disregard to grammar, who is somebody who believes and advocates a theory that language, knowledge of language has no relationship to knowledge of its grammar. 
and he's acquiring languages all over the continent uh, without any sense of grammar. Uh, and Gandhi and he befriend each other in, in, in England. So Narayan Hamjantra had written something uh, semi-autobiographical, which Gandhi would have had access to. Uh, but there are really no models of writing the autobiography that which, are, which are available to Gandhi. What does he, you know, what does he do? This is 1925. You should remember that he's come out of, it's been a horrible decade. 1922 is when Jalia Bagh around that time happens. Uh, it's a moment when Gandhi could have lost completely uh, the ascendancy that he'd begun to acquire in the national movement within the Congress organization. Um, you know, a bad political move on part of the British saves him because he put, put, they put him in prison. And you know, never put a falling star in prison. Uh, that's something that they should have understood. Gandhi sees that moment and spent time in the prison writing about the Satyagraha in South Africa. He comes out, and you remember he does this 24-day long fast in Delhi for what is called Hindu-Muslim unity, right? staying uh, first at Maulana Shokat Ali's house and then at Satpal Singh's house. Um, and it's a, it's a grand set of events which unfold around that. But he he's able to overcome that misadventure. But there is no political movement that Gandhi is part of. Um, the civil disobedience has been discredited. You know that there is a split in the Congress. So that's been the period. But Gandhi has spent these past three years thinking about his life in South Africa. When he comes out of the prison, this demand that he should write his autobiography has increased, which has come again from the ashramic community and the people around him. Their, in, their request to him that any way, every week, you need to write something for Young India, why not the autobiography? Now, it's a strange demand if you think about it. What Gandhi decides to do is to write autobiography on a week-to-week -week basis. It's not a text which is written like you and I attempt to write, said I am going to write an entire book and then publish it. The autobiography is written week after week. It's published week after week. That means people have begun to read it as it is being written something akin to the kind of mode of reading that we're becoming used to in the digital platforms. So, and people begin to write to him. Already the responses begin. So in some strange ways, it's a, it's a narrative which is, ought to be shaped by these conversations already taking place. There are hundreds of letters in the archives of the Sabarmati Ashram telling him, uh, oh, how much we like it, how much we don't like it, how bad the translation is, how good the translation is. Uh, should, he, should Mahadev Desai have used that word, this word, people correcting his memory, all kinds. So it's a, it's a narrative which gets shaped also probably through uh, as it is being written. Gandhi decides that he is going to write it and Mahadev is to translate it. We'll talk about Mahadev a little later. And as it's published, this, there will be a simultaneous English translation. There was no, there was no simultaneous Hindi translation, which is, which is very, very strange. Um, um, in any way, I think the Hindi literary world had a very different relationship to Gandhi. Uh, they did not translate the Hindi Swaraj till 1948. So that tells us something, right? I mean, um, the Hindi literary world did not translate the Hindi Swaraj till um, Kaka Sahib Kalelkar got it done in after Gandhi's assassination. Uh, so it's, it's translated in Hindi, uh, in, uh, from Gujarati into English, published also in South Africa and in a Christian paper in America called Unity. So at three places it gets, uh, it, 
comes out. When he decides to write the autobiography, Gandhi does something which has not been, which is completely out of character for him. He decides to stay at the ashram. If you, if you know anything of the life at the ashram or life of Gandhi, you know that he rarely spent time at the ashram. Ashram, he was an, he was an occasional visitor to the ashram. Never spending long stretches of time, maybe sometimes, sometimes a few weeks. He was constantly traveling. And that was the case also in South Africa. Uh, both at Tolstoy and at Phoenix, Gandhi's lament was that he did not ever spend enough time with the community. So Gandhi says, I'm going to spend time at the ashram. And he writes a public note saying, it's going to be my year of sabbatical. And uses the word sabbatical. Um, we should reconsider our policies of sabbatical um, um, everywhere. And uh, anybody wanting to write the autobiography should be given one. Um, decides to stay at the ashram. Then oh, he says, I'm not going to travel out of Ahmedabad. Very next week, he issues a further clarification, which is to say, ashram does not mean Ahmedabad. I'm going to be at the ashram, which means I am not going to be in Ahmedabad. He draws a very clear distinction between the city of Ahmedabad in where this ashram community is located and the community itself. So the idea was that he would stay within the ashram and not even go to Ahmedabad. It has huge implications for the idea of the ashram and its relationship to the city, which we are not going to go into today. Um, but he did include in, in his definition of ashram the Gujarat Vidyapit, which was three kilometers away, but it's an institution, ashramic institution, that a university that he had established. So the first decision is that it, he would stay at the ashram. And I call that one, the first kind of indwelling. To dwell within yourself, the first indwelling that happens is locating himself within the ashram and the ashramic community. That's one. The second indwelling that happens is within the Gujarati language. I don't think that there has been any discussion that he, go, he, he has about the, the language in which he is to write. That he, it, he, it would be written in Gujarati. Now, I don't think it should be an automatic choice. Because if you know anything about Gandhi's mode of writing, mode of thinking, Gandhi is a bilingual thinker. The entire text of Hind Swaraj is actually thought through in English and written in Gujarati. You can see the marks of bilinguality in every paragraph of Hind Swaraj. For example, I'll just give you one. The, the word that occurs the most times in Hind Swaraj is not the word Swaraj, is the word Sudhar. It's a text about what is the word Sudhar. Now, in Gujarati, the word is Sudhar. Sudhar would mean roughly reform. Roughly. It could mean the good path as well. Sudhar, as in the good path. When you read the English Hinswaraj, which is something that he wrote himself. He rendered the Hinswaraj in English himself. It was not translated by anybody else. He calls it a paraphrase, which he does. You realize that the word Sudhar actually represents seven very distinct categories, which could include, which, 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 which did not have the word civilization, which had civilization, modern civilization, contemporary civilization, ephemeral civilization, reform, progress, good conduct. 
he is actually thinking of seven different kinds of categories or things and, and using the word Sudha to describe. So Gandhi is a bilingual thinker that he should, he could have easily written the autobiography in English. He chooses to write it in Gujarati. Knowing fully well that the Gujarati language does not lend itself so easily to talking about oneself without the injunction of that, will this be a story of one's hubris? Will this be a story about where I speak about myself with a certain degree of pride? Now, if you were to speak in about yourself with a certain degree of pride, Gandhi felt that this would actually deviate from the object that it, which was before him, which was to talk, talk about his experiments with truth. So the inbreeding that happens is in Gujarati language. Third and fourth, he also needs, there have been two guides that he had, what he called a moral guide. The aspiration by which he decided he wanted to lead his life. Or when there was a moral darkness, these are the texts that he goes to. One is the Bhagavad Gita. The other is the Sermon on the Mount. He decides that he would spend the year thinking also of the Bhagavad Gita and the Sermon. Now, thinking for Gandhi meant living that. That's one. But also thinking about it in the most profound way possible. It's during this period that Gandhi gave his 272 lectures on the Bhagavad Gita every morning. So you can imagine Gandhi's day begins at 4.20 with the ashram prayers, and soon after the ashram prayers, as part of the ashram prayer discourse, he gives one lecture on the Bhagavad Gita, one verse of Bhagavad Gita, sometimes one word of Bhagavad Gita. Also during the same period, does he do his amazing translation of the Bhagavad Gita in Gujarati? So the, while the autobiography is being written, he's also translating the Bhagavad Gita, also giving a series of explanatory lectures on Bhagavad Gita. And if you've seen those 272 lectures, these are perhaps some of the finest philosophical discourses in, in Gujarati language um, that's, that's there in the last thousand years of its history. So he is thinking constantly about the Bhagavad Gita and what it meant. But he's not thinking of the Gita in isolation to the other text, which is the sermon. All cities commit crimes. Um, some cities commit crimes more often than others. And I come from a city which um, um, is a habitual offender. Uh, but I think among the worst crimes it's committed is, is, is this. The students of Gujarat Vidyapeet, of which he is the founder and the chancellor, invite him for a Saturday le lecture, saying, will you please talk to us every Saturday? I mean, you're talking to the ashram community. We come there. It's early morning. Nobody gets up at 4.20. Right? Um, um, it's, it's too difficult. So Saturday afternoon after you know we've done our week's work, please come and talk to us every Saturday afternoon, one lecture. And Gandhi says, what is it that you would want me to talk about? He says, the Sermon on the Mount. So the student asked him to speak about the sermon. Gandhi began the first lecture. And there is an uproar. In the city, in Vidyapit, saying two things. One, Gandhi was committing the crime of reading the Bible. And what is the crime of reading the Bible? It's an obvious crime. Reading the Bible leads you to convert to Christianity. It's not the Christians who are saying, you can't read the Bible. It's the Hindus who are saying, you can't teach the sermon. And the lectures stop. Gandhi 
Gandhi wrote a very, very, very moving essay after that, which is called The Crime of Reading the Bible. Uh, it robbed Gujarat, and I think all of us, um, of a great possibility of what that reading or what this set of lectures would have really meant. Uh, because if you're looking at what Gandhi is saying in his discourses on the Bhagavad Gita on the life of Christ, you begin to think that he is doing something radical both with the life of Christ and with the Bhagavad Gita. For example, he's asked, I mean, one term that reoccurs constantly in the Bhagavad Gita, the two terms. One is the idea of a yogi, as to who is the yogi. And you know, verse after verse talks of the yogi. And, and the ashram might say, but give us an example. If we had to follow an example, what is that example? And he says, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a yogi. Now, then he's asked several days later, he said, you keep speaking about the sacrifice, yagya, and saying we need to do yagya. Our life has to be one of constant yagya. Is there a life of yagya? He says, yes, the life and death of Jesus is a perfect example of yagya. Now, these two instances should tell us as to what, what those lectures on the sermon could have actually done for us. But Gandhi decides to indwell. So there are three kinds of indwelling which are taking place. One within the ashram community, one within the Gujarati language and thinking about oneself, Third, about within these two texts, the Bhagavad Gita and the sermon. <clears throat> and the autobiography gets written. It would be, you know, and there is a, there's a certain kind of chronological linearity to that as well. Um, but then interesting things happen while you're reading it. And, and we know this because people have started writing to him. A lot of people write to him saying your facts are wrong. And these are not, these are not people like me. These are not busy bodies which surrounded Gandhi and saying improve yourself, you know, there was always this idea that Gandhi needed to improve himself uh, uh, more, and, and the ashramites always felt that Gandhi was not really enough of a Gandhian, and he needed to improve himself. So there were these people around him who would constantly say, Bapu do better, Bapu do better. These are not that kind of people. These are his very close associates from let's say South Africa, writing him to say, him saying, you know, the, the events that you're narrating, or the facts that you're narrating, are not the way you remember them to be. This is my alternative construction of the facts. Now, Gandhi publishes these letters in his journals. So he's, he acknowledges that Sonia Schlesian has written to me saying, you've lost it. And she writes it, I mean, she says, you have lost it, stop the autobiography. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, or even somebody like Polak telling him, or telling Mahadev that, you know, Bhai's recollections of some of these things are not necessarily the way these things happen. And Gandhi publishes them. He also issues corrections. At no point, either during that period or thereafter, are these corrections ever made in the text of the autobiography. So if you were to tell him, oh, this does not happen this way, and he would say, I, I think Pollock is right, and it should be read corrected, that correction does not get made into the autobiography when the autobiography is published as a book. So if you did not read all the, the correspondence and Gandhi's clarifications about it, one would not get a sense that there is there is a discussion about veracity of facts which is taking place. Now, it begins to, to you know, um, then you begin to ask yourself, what is the relationship between fact and truth? 
because Gandhi clearly admits to lapses in veracity of facts. At the same time, he has no desire whatsoever to make any correction, even while issuing a clarification, even while issuing an apology sometimes, to say, I'm going to make a clarification or, or correction in the, auto, the text of the autobiography. And then you begin to realize that Gandhi is writing what he calls an Atmakatha as against what has been written so far, which is a Jeevan Vruttant. I don't know whether these two words make sense to you in your language. Jeevan Vruttant is a chronological narrative of one's life. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's what a Jeevan Vruttant is. So a lot of the what passes off as autobiographies are Jeevan Vruttant. Such and such thing happened, this is the role that I played, or these things happened, where recollection of events, incidents, people is important. And if you falter on that, at least that episode in that narrative is something is brought under question. There is something called Jeevan Vruttant, and Gandhi says, I'm not writing a Jeevan Vruttant. I'm writing an Atmakatha. I'm writing the story of the self. How am I writing the story of the self? I am writing the story of the self as my Antaryami tells me. Having written four parts of it, suddenly while writing a chapter called Christian Contacts in the fourth part, Gandhi suddenly tells us as to how he writes the autobiography. He says, I have no notes. I have no newspaper clippings. I am not referring to my diaries. I sit down on the appointed day and write as the Antaryami tells me to. The dweller within. Now, what, what does the dweller within then tell you to do? The dweller within today tells me to write about this. I write about it creates huge problems philosophically about reading, about the way you and I can enter that text, the way you and I can actually begin to open up the text. Because, because if it is something, it's not a revelation. He's not saying that this comes to me. This is not a revealed text. He's not saying that. I am moved to write this by my Antaryami. Now, two questions arise. By what process does Gandhi listen to his Antaryami? That's one. Because you, know, you, need, you need that communion with yourself to be able to listen to what he calls that small, still voice. And two, are there things which elude him and therefore are incommunicable. Very, in the very first introductory essay on the autobiography, Gandhi says that yes, there are things which are incommunicable. It, and it, it's rendered in English as that, that there are things which are known only to oneself and one's maker. And but the autobiography is not about those things. It's not about the incommunicable. Now, my engage with the auto, engagement with the autobiography really began with that sentence. Because when I read it in English, I realized that you know, if one were to use the idea of the maker, Gandhi's God becomes a good potter. God makes. Now, nothing of what I had read of Gandhi gave me the sense that Gandhi's God was a karta. Gandhi's God was not something or somebody or an entity that made. And I said, what does he say in Gujarati? And it's a completely different 
philosophical statement. He says, there are some things which arise in the soul and find repose in the soul and are incommunicable. It's not about knowledge of the maker. And then I realized that one needed to bring the autobiography as it was written in Gujarati and as we read it in English and translate it in all these languages in which we do, over 45 languages in which, or maybe more, that we've translated. And if uh, everybody has their way, by the end of this year, it will be in 152 languages, I'm told. Um, I dread. Uh, but that's, that's all right. Um, 150 years and so 150 languages. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's a simple um, thing. My engagement of reading the autobiography as two texts which needed to be put together really began with that. But clearly there are things which are incommunicable. Now what are the incommunicables in the autobiography? So you really, if one really wanted to read the autobiography, uh, what one had to do, I think, was to read the autobiography at one level, which is what Gandhi communicates, and which is where we can enter and say, this is wrong, this is right, or this is what it means. We can, we can do debates about language, uh, purpose, intention, everything. Then there is that layer which he says is there, I am not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you, not because I do not wish to reveal it, it's because it's incommunicable. Now, what would be fascinating is that we start looking in Gandhi's life to instances where he is not being able to communicate something of the experiment. And then you come to this entire notion of the Antaryami speaking from within and Gandhi's constant need to listen to that Antaryami. Now, if you take the Antaryami away from Gandhi, what he calls the inner voice, the voice of conscience, the voice of truth, or more beautifully, he calls it a small, still voice. If you take that away, you're taking the entire interiority of Gandhi away. Because Gandhi's interior life, or, or a large part of his self-practices, whether they be of the prayer, of walking or of spinning, of fasting, of observing or not observing brahmacharya, uh, all of these actually are about this need, this desire and cultivating this capacity to listen to the antaryami. If you take that antaryami away, there is nothing of the Gandhi that we know or the Gandhi that, you know, what moves Gandhi is this capacity to hear the voice from within. Because not only in, in moments of what are seen as spiritual crisis, but in terms of political crisis, uh, suddenly the Antaryami comes up like a bad sofa spring and says, you shall fast, or you shall go for a walk, and you shall walk for 23 days. Mm -hmm some such thing, you shall not wear footwear. I mean, the Antaryami is issuing very precise instructions to the man. Uh, uh, tells him, oh, you will fast. Not, not only the Antaryami tells him that you will fast, Antaryami tells him the calendar of fasting. It's, a, it's an amazing relationship that he has. It tells him 21 days. It says it will begin, and, and, and Gandhi ascribes all of that to the Antaryami. Now, you can then begin to say whether this is how the Antaryami speaks, but Gandhi's Antaryami clearly does speak to him that way. And we will see what implications it has uh, on something else. Now, if you take this capacity and need of listening to the voice from within away from Gandhi, nothing of Gandhi's interior life or self-practices either make sense or can hold. Because Gandhi says that all his endeavor for his entire conscious life, his search for truth is guided by the fact that the availability of Antaryani. 
if you take the availability of antaryami away, there is nothing of my self-practice left. Now, you would expect Gandhi to have a sense of equality. And Gandhi says, well, antaryami is available to all. But that does not mean that all of us have the capacity in an equal measure to access the antaryami. And he says, I, I, I claim, I mean, there are very few times that he makes these large claims about himself. And one of those claims is that I, I claim that I have, through a constant practice of self-examination, cleansing myself, constantly being in touch with myself, examining myself like a scientist would, I have cultivated the most tender of breast. And that tender breast allows me the capacity to listen to Antayami. So the autobiography then begin, becomes a story of this Antayami's unfolding at a very large level. Now, if one were to read the autobiography as a story of the Antaryami, one is posed with a philosophical problem. How do I enter it? And Gandhi says, enter it by all means, because this is not the incommunicable part. Since I have been able to communicate, it means that you can enter it. You, but it is not a performative text. That means you can't start emulating it. This, so therefore, if I do not eat salt, and you decide not to eat salt, those are not comparable events. It might have similar biochemical reactions on our bodies. That's possible. But my act of eating something or not eating my act of walking or not walking, my act of wearing or not wearing, my act of writing or remaining silent is not the same as what you do. It actually should have been a great lesson for the Gandhians, that there is no emulation of Gandhi that he's advocating. Uh, while a lot of what is called the Gandhian self-image and self-practice has been to emulate what Gandhi does, which is to say, get up at 4.20 and um, find a neem tree from which you will make a twig and, and uh, clean your dentures. If you don't have dentures, you are not a Gandhian. Uh, uh, um, right? uh, you can be a Gandhian only if you have a pair of dentures. Um, no, that's, so the, this idea of the imitation of Christ, which is very important to the Western tradition, there is no imitation of Gandhi possible. So the Antaryami is not somebody who allows you to imitate Gandhi. You can enter the text, you can't imitate the text. It's not a performative text. That if I were to do the same set of experiments, that means um, steal something and we will, and so that my, my father weeps or whatever, right? Or we will not achieve, we will not achieve similar results. So it's not a laboratory manual. And that's something that we need to understand about reading of the autobiography. The other thing which it, it does to us is it says, if it's, so, so therefore, if in these instances when we read the autobiography, while reading it we find something remains inexplicable, something remains inaccessible, it becomes our responsibility to go into the other incommunicables and say, is there something which begins to illuminate this? Is there something which is happening here, which Gandhi says, I'm going to go on a fast. Right? Uh, now, is there something happening around him which explains it? Is there an external agency which is dictating this? Or as Gandhi says, it is something which is internal to you. So that's something that we need to, to do. So reading the autobiography requires, I think, two acts of reading. One is to read the text as we read, either in the original or in the translation. We will not go into that. But at the same time, reading 
what is not said. Not said not because Gandhi has excluded them, but because Gandhi felt that these were incommunicable. I think, I think, I mean, one set of readings that I've done all points to me, for example, that if I wanted to find out what are the points at which Gandhi is not able to communicate of something that he decides to do. The most amazing set of examples are around his fasting. Suddenly Gandhi would announce, um, I'm going to fast. And I'm going to fast for self-purification. So it's, it's clearly something which is happening to me, that there is dirt within me, I need to cleanse it, and the mode of cleansing it is to dwell closer to God, to dwell closer to truth. Upa vas. Upas does not mean fasting, upas means being, being closer to God. The, the physical physicality of that upas is that you deny yourself food. But the idea really is to dwell closer to God. Now, if you were to examine these acts of fasting, you begin to realize what are the things that he's being able to communicate, not being able to communicate. Also interesting, I'm saying using the word fasting because there has been a lot of dialogue that takes place around fasting. Tagore gets involved, for example, and says, um, what gives you the right to fast? And if you need to fast, fast in the isolation of your Radai Kunj, why do you need to make public? Hmm. Yeah. To somebody coming and saying, but when you fast, you're doing coercion unto me. Dr. Ambedkar. Saying, you are doing something which is patently immoral. Your act of fasting is an immoral act. So there is a lot of interesting ethnographic material available for us to enter the world of fasting. So that's why, that's one example that I'm giving you. The other example, which is an equally problematic, well, more problematic uh, example is Gandhi's experiments with his celibacy. There are some things that he's able to communicate, there are some things that he's unable to communicate, some things that he's unwilling to communicate. Now, why, why should somebody at the age of 78 feel the need to have one final proof of the success of celibacy. Something that he could not communicate to anybody. His, not his closest associates, not his friends, uh, not to anybody. And still the man persists and persists to the detriment of everything else. He's warned that, you know, you're doing this at this juncture in India's life is endangering the possibility of India's freedom. And he says, but no, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay? So I think if one way to look at the idea of brahmacharya very seriously, one actually begins to understand the experiment with truth. Because the word brahmacharya does not mean celibacy at all. It means charya, which means conduct, which leads to brahma, which is truth. All those modes of conduct which lead one to truth is brahmacharya, in which the practice of celibacy is one of them. But the practice of celibacy is not the sum total of the practice of brahmacharya. So I think that if one were to read the autobiography with a series of readings or parallel readings of the acts of fasting and parallel readings of this unfolding drama about the quest for truth, then a reading of the autobiography becomes possible. But let me close it with a reminder of what the Antaryami can do. In 1947, in Calcutta, soon after the partition and independence of these two countries, Gandhi embarked on a fast, on a three-day 
what, what amounted to be a three-day to four-day fast, which came to be called the miracle of Calcutta, right, which transformed Bengal uh, in, in, in ways uh, that one could probably not imagine at that point. Rajaji, that's Chakravati Rajgopalachari, has just been appointed the governor of New Bengal. He's the first one to go and take seat. Um, also, don't forget that Rajaji's daughter is married to Gandhi's son, so there is a relationship which is not political. There is another kind of relationship. They've been very, very close friends. Uh, they've relied upon each other for guidance, both in political and personal issues in times of moral crisis. And one afternoon, Rajaji is given this letter by Gandhi in Calcutta, saying, my inner voice has spoken, and I'm going to do an indefinite fast, fast unto death, an indefinite fast. It's not, um, it's not a fast which is for 21 days. So 21 days, you know that he's going to survive 21 days. But this is actually an indefinite fast. It could last for three days. It could last for 30. Um, I'm going to go on an indefinite fast, and, and I'm doing this at the prompting of the Antaryami. Now, Rajaji had in the past challenged Gandhi's Antaryami, specifically in 1933, saying, the Antaryami probably cannot speak to you in this way. Now, if you challenge Gandhi's Antaryami, that's challenging Gandhi's most vital core. I mean, if you challenge him on anything else, uh, he would be able to field it. But how do you actually field the question about the inner voice? Yeah. And it leads to perhaps one of the finest set of essays about listening to this voice which is actually as uh, happens as an intervention that Rajaji has done. So Rajaji has this history of questioning Gandhi's Antaryami. And Gandhaji, uh, Rajaji looks at this. Now, you have to understand that if the Antaryami can lead you astray, and if the Antaryami speaks to you falsely once, or Gandhi says, if you are not able to distinguish between the voice of Rama and the voice of Ravana, all your previous acts of having claimed to act on the basis of the Antaryami are brought in question, which is the problem with revelatory mechanisms or auditory experiences. Uh, what if it is a satanic verse? What if I hear, heard it wrong? Or what if the voice that I heard was not that of God, but that of falsehood? So this relationship between antaryami and, and truth is very, very close. Gandhaji, Rajaji reads this statement, in which, towards the end, Gandhi had said, now, what had happened to Gandhi was these prolonged acts of fasting that he had done and all the other experiments with food that had gone on all his life had made him intolerant to plain water. He needed, uh, whenever he drank what is called plain water, um, I mean, neat water, um, um, uh, he had nausea. And specifically, this would get accentuated during acts of fasting. So during fasting, if he allowed himself, let's say, so many ounces of water during the day, um, it, had to be, it had to include soda bicarb and a squeeze of lime. So, right? Um, otherwise, he couldn't, couldn't take the water. I mean, it would be very, very painful. Um, um, so Rajaji reads the statement, and towards the end of the statement, there is this statement that uh, during this fast, I would have soda mixed with a squeeze of lime. And Rajaji says, uh -huh. the Antaryami told you 
to squeeze a line. And Gandhi takes that piece of paper and he says, no, that was my edition. And he removed that. Of course, Rajaji would have beaten himself having done that because for the next three days, um, Gandhi kept puking. And every time he puked, Gandhi, Rajaji would have been reminded that you know, he should have allowed the Antaryami a certain amount of leeway. So I'm saying when you read the story of the Antaryami, also read with a squeeze of lime. Thank you. You can rest, right? Yeah, so you could call it intuition. You could call it by whatever name, right? Now the question arises, the question is this, that this is what happens. My intuition tells me to do something. And I act upon it, right? Now, do I, and it has implications. It has implications on life other than my own life. It has implications, let's say, on, on an institutional life. If the, your vice chancellor suddenly decided to have an institution, not an institution, an intuition, uh, and act upon it, it has implications on your timetable. Which means that you have to then allow me access to your intuition. So by what, therefore you have to say, by what process do you arrive at the idea that you have heard an intuition, right? That what you've heard is valid, and it is so valid that even if it to affect the lives of many others, you would want to hold on to it. So call it by whatever name. What it requires is a series of self-practices which go along with it to create a mode by which, to, for want of a better word, you need to create protocols of transparency. Right? Which is really where the problems of in intuitions or antaryamis, or inner voices, or outer voices arise. So is it rationalizing? No, it's not rationalizing. It's actually making it more opaque in some ways. Yeah. But ra to, to say it rationalizes, it means that if something is rational, right, it, that means it ha you and I have equal access to that explanation. Now, you and I do not have an equal access to an antaryami or an intuition. If it's your intuition, you have one level of access, and I have probably zero access, or, or sometimes even a greater access. I don't know. But you have to open yourself up to say, here, come, examine this intuition. So if you really read Gandhi's writings about himself, why is he obsessively writing about his self-practices? Not in the autobiography. The autobiography actually is only half of a document of what Gandhi writes about himself. Constantly Gandhi is inviting you to enter his life, saying, saying gross things, for example, Today, I had an involuntary discharge. Now, why do you need to know, know that? I mean, why does the country need to know that? The country needs to know, we are told in the evening, for various reasons, right? Um, the nation needs to know whatever that thing, uh, entity is, right? Uh, why does the country need to know that MKG today woke up devastated? So you need to create protocols, and I'm using the word protocols, of self-explanation. So if you do not have those protocols, I have no access to your intuition. 
I can then term your intuition as either truthful or falsehood depending upon my predilection towards you or towards the action which is based upon it. So what you would see in Gandhi is a series of self-practices which invite the people into the inner workings of both his mind and his body of the kind that no norm, no usual practice of notions of privacy of selfhood would are necessary um, hi, uh, thank you so much uh, my question is actually taking from what you have said and it sort of arises in my own work on gandhi and that is uh, while you have stressed on the antaryami what i'm also finding in addition to the antaryami in gandhi is this is this persistent uh, refrain that man need not know all for gandhi he keeps saying uh, and time and again gandhi is and this is in addition to the antaryami which is the inner voice there is also this outer mm. invisibility in gandhi that you cannot know everything mm. that uh, time and again gandhi is saying that oh well i don't even know if my actions are right mm. i don't even know if i was actually non violent mm -hmm. or things like that mm. how how do we then capture this this absence of language uh, or, mm. or lexis it's almost like wittgenstein isn't it yes it's almost like wittgenstein right yeah, i mean if in actually there is a 1933 word uh, sentence which says can one say does one say all to others now it could be from the tractatus right so there is the gandhi has this constant struggle to communicate and also to not communicate right? and it's not only about the antaryami okay? it is for example how do i explain how do i explain the idea of ahimsa as against the idea of non violence i i don't know whether you are aware of uh, uh, these are the quirky things that he wrote which i find very very interesting among the most amazing set of writings on non violence is about dogs now somebody somebody went to gandhi and said is it all right to kill a rabbit dog gandhi said not it's all not only it's all right it is ahimsa and then um, you know that would have been all right if it's he tells you and you go and happily shoot a dog and 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 the thing is all right um he then wants to advocate it as the policy on ahimsa to the jains said if you are a good jain kill dogs it's a huge failure of communication at one level right and he wrote eight essays call is this humanity <laughs> explaining his relationship to to dogs to himsa to taking life not taking life relationship of that life with pain that you can only perceive but is not communicated to you right so there is this constant struggle that gandhi has to communicate very difficult ideas that he's grappling with for example the other example that i'll give you which is that about calf killing right i mean there is this calf at the sabarmati ashrams gaushala which is suffering and gandhi says let's put it to death not not only put it to death it is necessary to do so in in my scheme of things as pure ahimsa and there is pandemonium in the ashram as you can imagine yeah. and in the city and then in the country that gandhi killed the calf imagine you know no no different from the kind of debates that you and gandhi writes about calf killing so G gandhi has this uh, what gandhi is doing is that it is a pedagogic mode at another level the idea that which is there in hind swaraj that people are not forged in a day people have to be constantly forged and uses the word praja not to mean rashtra but as people okay? 
um, and, and, and so yes, there is something uh, of that nature that's taking place. Uh, clearly on Brahmacharya, and, and, and when you read, let's say next year, uh, when Manu's diaries begin to, to come out sometime next year, or maybe this year, uh, you would realize as to how that how difficult that communication is with, with everybody else. Or even probably with Manu. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, it's been one of the most riveting talk that I've been to in recent times. Um, so you spoke about, um, um, you know, there is a way in which Gandhi, um, Antaryami is in some ways absolutely singular to that subject, right? There is a, there's a claim around singularity there. Um, and you mentioned that it's beyond emulation. What he's trying to do is beyond emulation. Um, and yet in some ways you're speaking of pedagogy. Pedagogy presupposes, in a certain sense, a version of emulation, right? Um, so how do you work that tension out? I mean, the reason why I ask this question is because in some ways many, um, I mean, I'm thinking of work of Bill Grammy, for instance, um, even Uday Mehta, um, who in some ways speak of uh, the idea of exemplarity, right? Um, in other words, Gandhi makes his life an example for the others to follow, right? Um, so. What does it mean in this context when you're saying it's a form of exempl Can we say, I don't know if you agree with those readings and how you differ and so on, um, can we in some ways talk about exemplarity um, in a way where it is not emulation, right? Uh, and so how, do you, how would you work these you know, set of issues out? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, thank you. Um, um, you know, Gandhi, it's not that Gandhi does not work with the idea of the exemplar. He's constantly working with the idea of the exemplar. Now, uh, you know, and, and the exemplars vary. I mean, there is the life of Socrates that he exemplifies, and the life of Christ that happens, and life of prophets happen, and life of Buddha happens. And I'm saying there are these large examples that he actually puts us. Plus, there is also the life of Valyama. And today, of course, is Valyama's uh, death anniversary. It's strange. The first woman to die in the Satyagraha campaign in South Africa um, um, today happens for some reason. And today is also, I, I don't know whether it's, yeah, today is Valyama. Uh, so the exemplar could be Valyama. Now the problem, the, the, the relationship between the exemplar and pedagogy is this, or the tension is this, is that for an exemplar to become pedagogic example, you require explanations or availability of self-practices. I'll give you an example. Now, when Gandhi says, Jesus, the life or the passions of Christ is sacrifice. Now, that claim can be made because let's say you have the gospel. The series of gospels tell us that this is the, the self, series of self-practices of, of this person, Jesus of Nazareth, which make him Jesus Christ. Can you then emulate those self-practices? No. What one can do is to tease out pedagogic principles from those self-practices. So the self-practices are not for emulation. Self-practices, I think, are for formulating principles which then can inform your own conduct. So for ex that's why I said, by getting up at 4.20 in the morning, do I become prayerful or do I become insomaniac? In my case, the latter. Right? But do I need, a, do I have a theory of wakefulness which has got nothing to do with waking up at 4.20, which might have something to do being awake at odd hours. But that theory of wakefulness has no relationship to waking up at, at the hour that Gandhi woke up. Now, our, our practice of emulation would mean that we actually emulate the timetable and do what he did. 
without having a corresponding theory of wakefulness. And where does Gandhi acquire this idea that when it is the night of all beings, the all-seeing one is awake? That's what he says. And he says that's, that's what an ashram is. Now, unless one has that, and so therefore, what other sense of, what other responsibilities come with that wakefulness? What are you wakeful about? Are you wakeful about your body? Are you wakeful about your mind? Are you wakeful about what you do unto others? So I think um, this relationship between emulation and pedagogy is a very important relationship. And it needs to be philosophically worked out. I do not think that Gandhi at any point advocates that either an avatar or an exempli exemplar needs to be emulated. You, what you need to do from the life of an exem uh, exemplar is to actually create a philosophical ground through which you engage with this ex the exemplar. And that is your learning. That is the pedagogic role that the exemplar plays. So I, if I can't engage with the life of Christ or with the life of prophet or with the life of Socrates, from that platform that, that the exemplar makes available to me, my engagement is going to be at one level. No amount of emulation or imitation is going to enlighten me about that life. Thank you. Just following up from what you just said, uh, so, uh, so is this uh, is this also the way? Uh, so uh, uh, just uh, seeing what you said about uh, one year of uh, in ashram that Gandhiji decided. Is it because that probably th that it did came from uh, Thoreau's uh, one year in the near the Walden Pond? Because we know that he was influenced by Thoreau's uh, Walden yeah. and. But you know, I mean, um, if he really wanted to be away. Right? I mean, if he wanted to, to emulate or, 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 or do what Thoreau did, uh, why come into this circus called the ashram? Right? I mean, don't forget, uh, Mahadev Desai called it a menagerie. It was, <laughs> it was the collection of the strangest animals possible, the ashram, right? including Gandhi himself. Right? Uh, you do, if you're looking for solitude, you don't go to the ashram. The ashram is important because the set of ashram rules, or what he calls the ashram vrata, by which he is leading his life, which I, he says are important, uh, are the only principles which allow him the access to both truth and the antaryami can be best performed within what he thought was the ashram community. So the relationship that he has with the ashram community and the ashram rules make it necessary for him to be at the ashram and at no other place. Otherwise, he should have been at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla. He was very fond of going to that place. So he should have gone there. Right? Or, or Kosani, where he sat and wrote the introduction to the, uh, to the Bhagavad Gita. So, I mean, um, um, Gandhi's relationship with the ashram community is something that we've not really worked through, but that's important. Yeah. Uh, uh, how did Gandhi reconcile with his criticisms? Like, you were telling about how Ambedkar, uh, uh, I mean, said his act of sacrifice is immo Im immoral. Like, how, did Gandhi think about it deeply, or, I mean, did he try to make amends to his uh, thoughts, or, I mean, how did he reconcile with it? Did Gandhi think about the criticism very seriously he did? Did he act upon it sometimes? I'll give you an example. This is my theory. There's no validity to, but years of, of cohabiting the same space as the old man, um, the Puna Pact leads to a horrible moral pressure being put on Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, I think if there is an immoral act that Gandhi has done, completely indefensible, immoral act, and if you call Gandhi immoral, that's the 
the vilest thing that you can say to him or say about him it has been the Pune Pact fast, not the pact itself. I'm saying the mode in which the pact is arrived at, the modality, because I think the means were not pure. And therefore, the ends, Gandhi himself would say, can't be pure. That happens. And the country moves on. Dr. Ambedkar moves on. Gandhi wants to move on. He is a prisoner in Yarabda. Several months later, and he, he's, he barely survives that fast. And it's a fast of only three days. Huh? I mean, look at, I mean, I think it has the, the reaction of the body to an immoral act, the body knows. It's so, it's so bad, that fast, right? That Tagore, who could not be moved otherwise, takes a train from Bolpur and lands up at Yaravda knowing fully well that the old man is going to, to cop it. I mean, Tagore is not otherwise easy to, to get him out to do these long train journeys across the continent. Three days, the fa and it, you know, all descriptions of his physical self, he could not move, he could barely speak, he was constantly on, you know, Somebody who's done 24 days, like, you know, as if, you know, as a routine matter of fasting, why should by three days the body should give in? So there's something happening to the body. The, the act is done. Within nine months, Gandhi announces this fast for self-purification for 21 days. He's still a prisoner. There's nothing that he has done which requires self-verification, except to, as an act of atonement. What is, what, what is, why is he feeling so sullied within himself that he needs to do 21 days of self-verificatory fast? So my answer, yes, Gandhi does respond. He responds not immediately sometimes. He needs time to, to, to fathom that. He needs to time to fathom what that response needs to be. And he comes up with sets of responses which, which are unique to, to him because they arise from his self-practices. So I think the 21-day fast is an act of atonement. So he does. I mean, and sometimes, um, uh, or otherwise, I mean, sometimes he says, "I'm sorry. I mean, I, I did it wrong." Or sometimes he just digs it and says, um, "You know, I'm sorry. You need to, to to work harder to convince me. I'm not convinced." But he has no problems um, admitting to lapses of memory of judgment. Um, sometimes, I mean, his problem is that he magnifies it. Because you know there's something happening uh, by which when you bring it to to under under close scrutiny, the act becomes larger than what it might have been. I mean, every time he makes an error, it becomes a Himalayan blunder kind of thing, right? I mean, we do that all the time. I mean, I, you know, I, I would say, do read the autobiography, and I think it's 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 a it's a great document. It's also, you know, those who are students of literature, it's a great literary. That translation is a great literary act. Uh, we don't see the translation of the autobiography as, I mean, I I don't know of any translation school teaching the autobiography or Hinswaraj as acts of translations. But you know, th there are various ways in which you could actually read the autobiography. And Mahadev's translation is, 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 uh, is source. I've rarely seen a translation that uh, rises so, so amazingly above the original sometimes.
Um, since no one is asking a question, let me just ask you. Um, I mean, um, you spoke about the distinction between uh, facts on the one side and the truth on the other side, right? I mean, um, how do you conceive the distinction, right? I mean, um, um, the various ways it, in which it's been conceived, actually. I mean, so for instance, uh, someone like myself who's um, um, you know, taken in by psychoanalysis for the longest time, uh, the same distinction between fact and truth is conceived in very, how should I put it, uh, in very secular ways, right? Um, how would you think about Gandhi's notion of truth? I mean, um, um, it, it's sort of a spiritual, it's in some ways non-secular. Um, it, it demands a certain relationship to the divine, how so we're conceived. Um, you know, it's the inner voice that you're speaking of, obviously. Um, so how do you, how do you, how would you meditate about that relationship? I, I mean, in some ways the entire talk is about that, um, if one were to sort of, you know, um. It's a very large question. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying therefore I'm not going to attempt an answer to it. Um, um, can one think of Gandhi's truth, or Gandhi's quest for truth, in absence of certain notion of the divine, or a certain notion of measure that lies outside of oneself, by which one measures one's conduct? I don't think so. Uh, you need that measure constantly. That measure could be divine, that measure could be something else. Right? Uh, could be antaryami itself. Right? Uh, but yes, you need, you need a referent other than the self to think of Gandhi's truth. And therefore, its relationship to the world of facts is different. Because the world of facts sometimes is self-referential. Right? Uh, empirically verifiable things. Uh, at the same time, the, pra the practice of truth also becomes important. So it's not only the meditation on truth which, which makes truth available, or the quest for truth available, the quest for truth also has to be lived for him. So set of practices which allow what he calls, taking from the Upanishad, he says, all that I want, or all that is given to one, not only to him, to, to all of us, is to make an attempt to lift that golden lid which hides the orb of truth. Not capture that, I mean, not hold that truth, but make an attempt to lift that lid which conceals truth. That's the, that's, but how do I actually make an attempt by which I am physically able to lift that lid? That's really where things, things happen. That's when, that's when the quest for truth and the practice of truth becomes interesting. I mean, therefore you have some, something like, I mean, it's very much like uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Of, 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 of Francis Xavier. What is the practice of love? Now, now, the practice of love will then lead you to the life of Christ. But you, ha you and I have to create our own practice of love today to lead a life in Christ. Right? Similarly for Gandhi and similarly for anybody else, you have to create your own self of set of practices which allow you to lead a life in truth or life in quest of truth. So for me, what has been the easier, uh, my own easier answer has been that right now, I'm trying to unravel the practices. Because I can't unravel that relationship. What's given to me or what's available to me um, is really trying and unraveling or understanding the relation, the self practices. So I can understand, for example, his acts of fasting. I will make an attempt to understand his acts of brahmacharya. I can understand, for example, uh, his uh, acts of walking. I can understand his relationship to prayer. Now, 
my hope is that when I do, let's say, understand these dozen self-practices and I have a more or less coherent story to tell about it, does that give me access to a certain unfolding of a relationship that Gandhi might have with truth? That's my hope. Now, it could be, it could be a completely warped way of looking at the idea of truth. It could be a non-philosophical way of looking at it, but I'm not a philosopher. I also have no access to Gandhi's interiority. Right? Uh, I, uh, I don't, I mean, I, I don't have, um, I mean, I, I, say, I say in the, in the, in the autobiography's introduction, oh, why is it that I'm not translating it again? I mean, I, you know, easier thing would have been for me to sit down with the original Gujarati and, and start translating it and create a modern translation which is what a lot of publishers would have wanted more than a critical edition, right? Um, which has really been in demand. I mean, very gifted people have been approached to, to, to do that. I say I, my inner life is so opaque that it cannot receive this. So I can do a linguistic translation, but I can't do what Mahadev does. Um, so it could be, I mean, my responses could also come from the kind of opaque life that I lead. Yep, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you.